Okay guys, it looks like I figured out how to actually get on Facebook Live, which <laughs> I I have to say I'm kind of impressed with myself right now, you guys. My joke is that I never really know um, how I got into this blogging thing because technology and I, we don't get along. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is a win. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the fact that I got on today is going to be enough. If that's all I accomplish, that's enough for me. Guys, um, if you didn't see my post from Facebook earlier today, my name is Shauna. I blog at nottheformerthings.com. And I am on today specifically because I have received just a lot of questions uh, since publishing the series on parenting an explosive child that I wanted to address directly. Now there is a post that's going to be live on the blog tomorrow specifically about how to help our children when they are melting down, when they're in the middle of um, having an, an explosive moment or, or are just completely out of control. And so I'm not going to get into a ton of that today because you'll be able to read that tomorrow without any problems. Um, what I want to talk about today are some of the more specific questions and the more intense questions that have come up that I think are, first of all, really difficult to ask. So my heart goes out to those of you that, that have asked this because I know I know where it comes from. I know it can be very isolating and very lonely when your child, you know, this, this little love <laughs> that you've got is struggling. And so I appreciate the, the heart behind these questions and want to make sure that I'm addressing them in a way that honors your heart and also gives you kind of my take on it. Before I get into them, let me start off where I always start, which is I am not an expert. I did go to school to be a special education teacher, but please know during the course of that training, I was never introduced to any techniques for helping children with explosive and out of control behavior. In fact, that was something that was sort of put into the category of discipline issues and uh, just kind of left there, which is unfortunate. I certainly could have used that learning, uh, not necessarily in the classroom, but certainly at home with my two boys. Anything that I have learned has honestly just been through trial and error. It's been through, you know, reading books. The Explosive Child by Dr. Green is one that I've referenced in the blog post because it is so good uh, in terms of helping us get into our own mindset and helping our children when they are exploding when they are having out of control behavior. Um, it's also come from, from talking to other moms. It comes from asking, you know, different occupational therapists and different people that are involved with children that have behaviors similar to my own. And more than anything else, it's been 10 years of, um, you know, some wins, some just colossal failures and trying to figure out what, what to do next. And so I share this not from a position of I've got it all figured out. I share it from the position of I'm a mom just like you and there are some things that work for my kids. And just like if you and I went and sat down and had coffee together one day, you know, if, if you were asking me this question, this is how I would answer. The first question that came up, and it actually comes up quite a bit because of the way that I write about our children's behavior and because I am so honest about how out of control it can be. Um, I think this is a question that a lot of people have and that is, how do you know when your child's behavior is something that is more a discipline problem versus something that um, that is is more of an explosive child issue, more of a brain function issue. Let's put it that way. So how do you know the difference? How do you know when it's time to crack down? Now, here's what I would say. If you are asking this question and you have read my post so far, or you're following the blog, or you have a child that is necessitating you reaching out for more information about how to help them when they are having explosive and out of control behavior, let me say this, it's probably not a discipline issue. Um, in The Explosive Child, Dr. Green specifically says, if this were something that a child could be disciplined through or disciplined out of, then it would already be lessening in your home. 
Um, the explosive child is one that is escalated. The explosive child is one that struggles um, with just simply maintaining control and function when put under stress for any reason. And so because of that, it is less of a discipline issue. It is more about helping them understand and helping them learn coping mechanisms to be able to function more appropriately and not hurt themselves and not damage things and not put you in a situation where you've got scratches and bumps and bruises from trying to help them. I think if you're at that place, chances are good, especially if you're reaching out to me and taking the time to write an email and desperately looking for the information, that you have done the very best you can for this child and it's still not working. And so I wanna encourage you, that's what this series is about. That's why I'm writing it because I think that a lot of times what happens is we get stuck in the, the blame and the feeling of this is somehow my fault and if I could just figure out what's wrong with me then my child would somehow be less explosive and that is in my experience that's just simply not true that's why this post um, has created an environment where all of these questions are coming in because we want to know what can we do we're desperate for the information the second question that's come out of that, and I think it's kind of the, the extreme example on the other end of the spectrum, is questions about restraint and restraining techniques. Um, and for those of you that don't know what that is, there are several different types of safe restraint that are sometimes advised for children who are just completely out of control and in danger of hurting themselves or hurting others. Um, I'm not gonna share any of those here. And, and again, I'm just gonna share with you what my experience has been. Uh, quite frankly, my experience has been that restraint, it, it never really works um, with either of my children. For a couple of reasons, I think that the first is that both of my children have some pretty significant sensory issues. And when you are already overloaded uh, from a sensory um, perspective, any sort of touch or restraint can be very difficult. Someone just asked, um, am I restraint trained? I have been trained, but only um, sort of ad hoc with one of the therapists, and it's not something that's worked. And so let me let me just say again, this is just my experience if you have a different experience or if you would like to leave some comments about what has worked for you please feel free to do that from my perspective what has worked more than restraint is um, defense like defensive techniques and so let me let me share with you what that looks like when um, my youngest in particular who tends to be the most violent and the most explosive out of my two children is is completely out of control. Like we have crossed the line from he's starting to escalate to all out lack of function and sort of just flailing and getting himself in situations that can be harmful for him and for me and for our environment. What has helped me is to defend myself or him or our environment. And so what I will do in that circumstance is I will grab like one of our couch pillows or I'll grab, um, we have like gigantic stuffed animals in our house. My kids love them. So I'll grab one of those, anything that's soft but big enough to provide some buffer and some defense between us. I will grab it and I will sort of physically uh, position myself to defend against his sort of violent action. So if he's trying to punch me, I'll pull the stuffed animal or I'll pull the couch cushion and put it in between us. If he goes up to kick a wall, I'll follow him and pull the couch push it, the couch cushion and put it in between him and the wall. Um, if he's even, sometimes he likes to slam his body into me, it gives a lot of um, vestibular input or proprioceptive input, sorry, to a child who is shutting down, particularly from a sensory perspective. I will hold that sort of defensive pillow or defensive, um, you know, soft thing in between us so that he can still get that input, but not hurt himself and not hurt me. 
from my perspective, and again, just mine, this is incredibly more effective. The first is when we tried restraint, I felt like it escalated the meltdown and, and the explosive behavior happened even longer because we were adding to the sensory input, because we were um, in a situation where we were um, adding to the pressure cooker that, um, that a child that is out of control creates. Being more defensive is what has helped us to not only keep our child safe and keep me safe or keep ourselves safe, but um, also helps to de-escalate because he can get the whatever out that he feels like he needs to get out, but without hurting anyone. There's only been one exception to this um, that I do just want to call out. And, and this isn't necessarily when he is at his most explosive. So, so keep that in mind. Um, oftentimes my youngest, because he has bipolar disorder and because he has anxiety disorder, there are times where he feels like he can't stop moving his extremities. And so he will start to panic because he feels like he can't stop his arms from moving or he can't stop his legs from moving. And in that instance, I will ask him, do you want me to help you? He'll be crying, I can't stop, I can't stop. And so I'll say, do you want me to help you stop? If he gives any indication, even if he can't speak and can't form the words, but if he gives any indication that he's open to that, then I will come in and, and restrain that movement to help him calm down. But that's really the, the only time where that um, is something that has worked for us and something that I would recommend. The next question about explosive situations is one that I wish I had a really great answer for, and it just don't. And that is, what do you do when you have two children that are melting down at the same time? When you have two explosive children that are losing it? <laughs> Fortunately, I feel like for, for our situation, for my two boys, this is actually not the norm. It does happen, but it's not as frequent as one or the other sort of having their, their rough time. When they both start to escalate and they both get out of control, um, the best thing that I can do in that circumstance and the way that I imagine myself as I think back on those times is kind of like, a lion tamer, you know, the old school lion tamer with a stool and a whip and you're kind of like balancing yourself between the different creatures. There's a little bit of that that goes on um, until I can get one of them calmed down. I do stay close, but not too close to any one child. I try and position myself between the two of them. Again, if I need to, I will grab something to use as a defense between the two of them. And then I will speak sort of back and forth in a calm voice, one after the other between my two children. So I might say, I can see why that upset you. I understand that that was hurtful. I, and I just kind of go back and forth with a very low, very calm voice between the two of them to try and get them to calm down. When I sense that one of them is close, not not there yet, but close to calming down, I will recommend that that one go and do something that they really love. And only when they're calm, because if they're already escalated, nothing is gonna help calm it down. But if I sense that the back and forth between um, the children is helping one of them calm down, I'll suggest something fun that they don't normally have access to during the day. Like, do you wanna play a video game for a little bit while I sit with your brother? Or, Maybe you need a snack. Would you like to have a nice little treat? Like something to get one of them calm and then I can go to the other. I don't know that that really is um, the most helpful answer, honestly. I wish that I knew. If any of you have suggestions, please, oh my goodness, leave them in the comments um, because I could certainly use your input as well. Like I said, the fortunate thing is that it's rare that both of them um, sort of get explosive at the same time. They usually take turns. I mean, we definitely have days where, where they both explode sort of off and on all day long, mostly because they're getting on each other's nerves as they do it. But um, for the most part, I don't have a lot of days where both of them are having out of control behavior at exactly the same time, which I'm grateful for. I think that's God's grace. And I also think that there is, you know, even in the most out of control circumstances, there's something in them that knows that, you know, there's only one of me and there's two of them. 
And so what happens is one will explode and I'll get him calm and then the other one will become a little bit more um, aggressive or out of control, almost in response. It's like, okay, good, now it's my turn, which is fine. I would rather handle that than what um, the poor mom that wrote me this email was asking, which is what do you do when you have two children that are explosive at exactly the same time? That's the best answer that I have. Like I said, if anyone has any other suggestions or anything that's sort of tried and true that they know works for their kids, please leave it in the comments. I would love to hear. So the last question that was asked, and this one is tough. I mean, I, uh, my heart, hurts when I think about the answer to this question and when I realize that there is um, a number of you out there that are, are feeling like your only resource is me in terms of emailing um, this question. And I'm glad you did and I want to address it and I want to answer it as best I can. And I also want to say that I'm not sure that I have anything to offer in this regard other than you are not alone and this is really, really hard. And that question is, at what point do I need to call 911 or do I need to consider psychiatric care? I can tell you what the therapists say. You know, the therapists say if you ever feel like your child is in danger of hurting himself or herself, if they're ever threatening to um, you know, do serious damage to themselves. Uh, my son, I'm sad to say, on a regular basis over the course of the last six months has really, really struggled with feelings of, um, of wanting to end his own life. Um, really, really hard stuff to have to live with. And then to have in the back of your mind, like, how do I help? What are my options? At what point has this gone beyond me? And do I need to bring in um, extra help, whether that's from, you know, calling 911 or getting my, um, my child into a psychiatric facility. These are really hard questions. And again, I'm not an expert. Like, I don't want to be the one that informs your entire opinion about this, but I do want to encourage you that this is not an uncommon question. And this is, this is reality um, for so many of us. Ooh, I just got a good question. What would I do if I had to work and couldn't homeschool? I promise I'll answer it in just a minute. Let me get to, um, to sort of how we manage bringing authorities into it and psychiatric care into it and that kind of thing. And then I promise I'll ask that because I have another homeschool question that I think we should address. Here's, here's what a therapist would say. A therapist would say, anytime you fear that your child is going to harm themselves, it is appropriate and um, a considered next step to either call 911 or take them to a local emergency room. That that is just uh, something that you might have to do in order to keep your child safe. Um, and and that's true. I'm not I'm not going to disagree with that expert advice, and I'm certainly um, not going to say anything. Um, unrelated to that. What I, what I will say for those of you that haven't been in this position yet, but, but you're getting there or you're concerned that your, that your child is going to get there, um, is, is this, this is a marathon life that we lead. Um, this is a long term, lots and lots of months, lots and lots of years of therapy and help and interventions and medications and successes and failures. It takes a long time to get to a point where these types of behaviors, especially when they're that aggressive, especially when we're starting to talk about, um, you know, inpatient psychiatric care or having to call 911. This is a very, very long um, process. And I think what was true for me is that when my son was actively saying over and over again that he wanted to die and that he was struggling um, just with the idea of staying alive, um, it felt to me like that would be a solution. Maybe not the end all be all, but I could always call and then someone would help. And the truth is, is that now that my son has been 
sort of in and out of partial hospitalization and hospitalization care, the truth is, is that it is just one step in this process. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't take that step and it doesn't mean that if you feel like you have done everything you can possibly do to help your child and they are still not in a position where you feel like you can keep them safe, that it's not 100% advisable and appropriate to make that call. But from a mother's perspective, from a mom's heart, I want to make sure that you know when you are making that call that it is just another step in a very, um, in a lifelong process and a lifelong attempt to find the resource that you, resources that you need to help your child. Um, and that's, that's all I can say about that. It's such a tough question and it's so hard. If nothing else, just know you're not the only mom that's been in that scenario and has had to make that heartbreaking decision. Um, I cannot tell you how many times that question has come up since three weeks ago when we first started this series on parenting explosive children. So those are the questions about explosive children that I wanted to address. Again, there is going to be a post live on the blog tomorrow about the specifics of managing our children's explosive behavior, like as it's actually occurring. Like, what do you do when your child starts throwing things, when your child is hurting you, when your child is, you know, making a hole in the wall, that type of thing. It's all coming tomorrow. So if you're interested in that and you feel like you need more help for those specific sort of in the moment types of questions, uh, please take a look at the blog post tomorrow. In the meantime, I want to move on to um, some questions that have come up about homeschooling. They also are in regards to a lot of the differences that my children have, not just their explosive behavior, but um, some of the other, the other things that we deal with from uh, just a, a brain function and learning differences perspective in our home. The first question I want to answer is one that came from one of you today, so thank you very much for asking it, and that is, what would I do if I had to work and I couldn't homeschool? So, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I did have to work when my youngest son, all the way up until my youngest son was in second grade, I worked and my children went to school, and every single day was... Um, was a struggle. I mean, honestly, it was difficult to get out the door. It was difficult to get him out of the car. It was difficult to get him into the classroom. It was difficult for me to leave and know that he's crying and I'm just abandoning him at school to go to my job. It was difficult for me to focus when I was at my job. I mean, for those of you that are in a situation where um, your, your education decision is not um, you don't have the luxury of making a different educational decision for your child and you have to deal with the school that that you've got and you have to go to work every day uh, please know oh my goodness it is hard I mean that is the the most sort of traumatic memories I have from when my children were younger have to do with that time frame when I was having to balance working and having them in school so if I couldn't homeschool if I had to go back to work tomorrow and I couldn't homeschool Here's, um, here's what I think I would do. I don't know for sure because fortunately I'm, I'm not in that position and I can just do sort of part-time things here and there to make ends meet and my husband takes care of the rest and I'm so grateful that, um, that God has sort of rearranged our life and allowed for that. If I had to go back to work tomorrow, I don't think at this point, given where we live, we live in Southern California. Um, before that, I lived up in Washington State, and so the school st system was very different um, up there than it is down here. I don't think I would put uh, my two boys into public school. I think that I would either investigate the charter schools in the area um, to look for sort of an alternative approach to education that would make sense. I would look at um, you know any private schools that I might be able to afford, although I couldn't afford them back then when I had to work, so I'm not sure I would be able to afford them now. Um, but I, I would definitely take a look at that. And then the last um, thing that I might consider would be sort of having some sort of in-home care for them. Um, that I would look at training to do some basic things throughout the day and then homeschool once I'm home at night or on the weekends. 
I do know a wonderful single mom who works more than full time and she homeschools her son and it has just been a beautiful thing to see how well it's worked out for them. I think it's really hard and I think she's really tired and I think there is a lot that the two of them give up in order to make that priority work in their in their lives and in their lifestyles, but I see the benefit of it and so I can imagine um, that potentially being something that I would look at if I found myself in a situation where I had to go back to work and you know I have these two children who um, are very different learners and wouldn't immediately just sort of fit into you know our local public school that's down the street so I hope that answers your question if you have any more specifics that you want me to address please just leave them in the comments um, the other question that came up in terms of homeschooling, and this comes up all the time, is sort of the legalities around homeschooling children with special needs. So let me just say this flat out. Um, no matter what state you are in, it is legal to homeschool your children no matter what their special needs. Now, Having said that, the caveat is every state has a different requirement in terms of what they expect from parents who are choosing to homeschool their children. And that is also true for every parent that is choosing to homeschool a child with special needs. So in some states, they require a different level of education for uh, the parent who is making the decision to homeschool. In other states, there's literally no requirement. It's exactly the same requirement for a child with special needs as it would be for you know any other child that's leaving the school system to be homeschooled. So you do have to make sure that you understand uh, your individual state's requirements, but it is not illegal to homeschool children with special needs. Let me just like put that out there right now because I get this question um, at least once a week. Someone asked me if it's actually legal to do what we're doing or how did I, how did I make it legal, I guess. And the truth is, is I didn't. We're, we're allowed to do this. Um, and And because I live in California, it's actually even easier. So for those of you that live close to me, um, that live in this area, there isn't an extra requirement um, independent of what you would do for any other child that is homeschooled if your child has learning differences and verifiable um, special needs. In California as well, uh, you actually can go through the school district if you choose to, even as a homeschooler for extra resources for children who have differences. And so what that looks like is you can qualify for uh, speech therapy, you can qualify for physical therapy, occupational therapy, educational therapy related to dyslexia, even evaluations and testing, all of that, at least in the state of California, I can't speak for every state, is available to homeschoolers if you choose to use them. You do have to jump through some hoops and you do have to do some bureaucratic bureaucratic things in order to be able to take advantages advantage of those services but you certainly can do that um, so yes we're legal and my guess is you would be too if you chose to make the decision to homeschool the other question and this is the last one that I have written so if anyone watching hi to all of you thank you so much for joining this is so fun um, like I said it's my first time I had no idea what this was gonna look like but it's been great the last question that I had ahead of time that comes up a lot is, I feel like it's too late to X, Y, and Z. And what should I do? So most recently this question came through about um, homeschooling. I feel like the damage has already been done. I had my child in school. And so now, um, you know, he's been bullied or she has such poor self-confidence. I don't know how to help her. I feel like it's too late. Um, another question that came up recently from a mom whose child they now have discovered has sensory processing disorder, but apparently she went through years and years and years of, you know, being told that it was a discipline issue or she just needed to, I don't know, make him wear socks. We've all heard it at one point or another, and this mom certainly had experienced it, but literally up until the point where her son was 12 years old. And so she feels like she's just lost all that time and that is it is it just too late to make an impact here's what I will say the the, the short answer is no I mean no it is 100% never too late from an educational perspective from a therapy perspective even from just a lifestyle perspective to 
make a change and do what you think is best for your child. Now, having said that, I understand where the question comes from. I understand the heart behind it because a lot of what, especially those of us that have children that are sort of diagnosed later in life or, or you know, even if it's not a diagnosis, it's just simply, you know, maybe school didn't work and I put in all that time and effort and now I'm realizing I need to make this decision and I feel like it's just, it's too late. All the damage has been done. When our children are older, um, a lot of what we get is um, resources, therapists, doctors, uh, teachers, you know, even other parents that talk a lot about resources that are for children that are very young. In fact, when my oldest son was diagnosed uh, with autism, he was nine years old. We had a very similar story to what I just shared from the mom who had sent me this question where, you know, we went years. Uh, I went years believing that a lot of the behaviors that we were seeing were 100% my fault. That if I had just parented him differently, if I had been more strict, if I had just forced him to wear shoes and socks, if I would have just made him eat everything that was at the table despite the gagging and the sensory issues he was seeing, then, then he would be great. And clearly I was just a poor parent. And then what was crazy was that once we had a diagnosis, a lot of what happened when we went to go and seek out these resources like occupational therapy, like speech therapy, like physical therapy, um, was that it was too late. That these resources are developed for children ages three to seven at the most. And that's sort of the prime window for impacting sensory issues and the like. And if you don't, if you miss that window, um, the impression that you're given is that you've somehow missed the opportunity to make an impact. And to the mom that sent me this question and to all of you listening, I say no. Like I just, I, I say absolutely not. That has not been my experience. That is not true. I think what is difficult is that most of the therapies that are out there are designed for younger children. And so, you know, rather than just saying, we don't really have a good system for dealing with a child who's 12 years old, um, the message that we get as parents is that, oh gosh, it's too late. Like we only deal with that when they're this young and if you don't catch it then, then um, I don't really know. Like it's, it's not gonna work and that's not true. What you have to do, unfortunately, and I know we're all overwhelmed. I mean, it's overwhelming just living life anyway and being a mom anyway. So you start adding in all of the other intricacies that come with having out of the box children and children with learning differences and special needs, and it can get overwhelming. But the truth is, is that if you're a mom who has an older child and you're feeling like you just somehow missed the window, you didn't get the diagnosis soon enough, or you didn't know what you didn't know back in the day, and now you think it's too late, what I will say to you is that it's not too late. It's just going to require a different approach than what's out there. It's going to require a lot of time on your part, observing your child, seeing what works and feeling free enough to just do that. Um, for my oldest, the difference between him when he was diagnosed at nine and where he is today at 14, especially in terms of sensory issues, social ability, his speech and language, all of that is, um, it's amazing. And, and by the grace of God, he is doing so well. But had we just stuck with the occupational therapy that was recommended for him that was appropriate for a four-year-old, I'm not sure we would have gotten there. It took, it took a lot to be able to figure out what really was working for him and implement that. So there are a few resources on, um, on the blog that speak directly to that. One of them is um, Sensory Processing Disorder is Real and It's Never Too Late. And there's another one about um, finding, finding therapies that work for our children. And that is all about kind of an out of box approach, especially when you have older children, how you kind of get in there and do the same things that therapists would do with younger children, but in ways that make sense for um, our late elementary school, middle schoolers. So gosh, I hope that that answers all the questions that I had. I'm so grateful and honored. It is a privilege that y'all would even think to send me these questions. I just want to say I appreciate you. 
Um, I love being able to do this. It is my heart more than anything else to connect with and to encourage other moms that, you know, that are just moms. It doesn't matter if you have children with learning differences or that are out of the box or quirky or whatever or not. Um, I think what you're doing is pretty amazing. And I think that it matters. I think it matters more than we can ever possibly imagine in the day-to-day -day crazy and messes that happen in our lives. And so I just want to say to those of you that were here with me live, I can't believe y'all showed up. Thank you so much for being a part of this, this first go around with Facebook Live. This was just a quick, easy way for me to talk about some pretty difficult subjects in, in a much more personal way instead of um, thinking about how to type it. I felt like I wouldn't be best able to communicate it in that manner and this was this was much more effective at least from my perspective so thank you all for jumping on uh, I imagine I might do this again soon but right now I, I gotta go get my son from his therapy <laughs> this is the way it works we can do it in the car well my son is actively engaged with someone else so thanks again guys have a great day I'll talk to you soon